Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So, I'm pitching my sermon for this morning as the sequel to Father Ed's fantastic sermon from last week. Though, uh, as someone told me after the 745 service this morning, uh, sequels are notoriously worse than the original, so that might be a designation I don't want to give this sermon after all. But um, those of you who weren't here last week missed a good one, and so have hopefully therefore learned your lesson about skipping church on Low Sunday. Uh, in fact, one of the things that Father Ed so artfully explicated for us last week is that Low Sunday has more appropriately been called Bright Sunday or Holy Humor Sunday within the Christian tradition. The idea being that the resurrection was the great reversal, the great punchline that led those who wept on Good Friday to burst forth with a holy and contagious laughter as the good news that Christ is risen went forth from the empty tomb on Easter. As Jesus himself had anticipated in Luke 6.21, Blessed are you who weep, for you will laugh. To all of this, I think we can only add our hearty amen. And yet, without taking anything away from that amen, I want to suggest this morning that we're still left with a question. At least that is, if we want to bring that point full circle. If Father Ed is right, and I think he is, that these are the days of joy and laughter, that we need to also come back and ask ourselves, why are they also so low? Two weeks ago, 1,200 people came in through those doors back there and sat in these pews and even stood against the back wall because there was no seats left for them in our pews. And yet the vast majority of those who were here then have not come back since, raising the question, why? If on Easter the masses were all let in on a great joke, why is it that so few are still here with us and laughing along? The most common explanation offered to address this nagging question is that everyone who is not here today has exhausted all their religious zeal on Easter itself. But there's got to be more to it than that. If people stay away from church in record numbers after Easter, then you have to wonder if it has something to do with the fact that for many, perhaps even for some here today, the Easter season is a disappointment. Two weeks ago, we proclaimed that Christ is triumphant over death and sin. Yet today, the graves of those who we love so dearly are still not empty. Neither has sin loosened its grip on the world if what we see in our hearts or our homes or on our TV sets is any indication. To put this differently, appealing to another point that Father Ed made last week, no joke is funny until it's reversal. And while Easter Day has sealed once and for all, the promise of a climactic reversal. There is, it seems, a colossal gap between the punchline of Easter and our experience of life in this world. And so for many of us, the gap between the promise of resurrection and the felt realities of grief, guilt, chaos and hopelessness is a gap that threatens to swallow up our fragile faith. No wonder these Sundays are so low. For all this, it seems, is almost too much to believe. In view of this, we could press the question, why the other way around? 
For the rest of our time this morning, I want us to think about the question of why did Easter not compel those who came to stay in this way? What are we to do with this gap? Is there a way to, res to resolve this tension between what we believe and what we see? For those of us whose faith is not yet sight, is there something we can look to as yet that might compel our own hearts and perhaps even the hearts of those who left us to believe, to believe once again? Our gospel reading for this morning gives us some help here. The Gospel of John, you may know, is written nearly two generations after the first Easter, as the last eyewitnesses of Christ's resurrection were entering into their final rest. That is to say, John writes these words as the gap between believing and seeing is just beginning to stretch for the early Christian church. And because of this, these last chapters in John's Gospel take on directly the disappointment of Easter, face squarely the difficulty we believe that Christ really did raise from the dead and that anything has changed as a result. These things are written, we read in the final line of last week's gospel reading, so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that in believing, you might find life in his name. John writes these final chapters of his gospel so that we might come to believe these things which are hard to believe and that our lives may be changed as a result. This is why John's first major post-resurrection story, which we read together last week, focused on Thomas. Thomas is the one who calls our attention to the gap between Easter proclamation and our present experience, who is himself stuck in the gap. And as such, he is our entry point into the story. As Jesus said, Blessed are those who have not seen, that's us, and yet believe. But Thomas is not alone in calling attention to the gap between our faith and our sight. Or if Thomas was the one who called attention to this gap, last week he did so as a setup for what we read this morning in John's very next chapter. For this morning, we encounter the one for whom that gap had become the widest. At least, at least we could say of those who were here, the hundreds that were here two weeks ago and are no longer with us, at least they stayed through Easter. But we could not say the same thing for Peter. Peter, who was Jesus' right-hand man. Simon, who was called Peter because he was to be the rock on which this church would be built. Peter, who at the very hour of our Lord's greatest need disowned Jesus turned his back on him, denying that he even knew him three times. There are few words in scripture that better encapsulate post-Easter disappointment than Peter's declaration at the outset of our gospel reading. I am going fishing. Heartbroken by the death of his Lord, confused by a tomb that he found empty, 
and confounded by the rumors that people had been seeing what he had not. We can almost hear Peter say, I just want to move on with my life. I just want to go back to the way things were before. Back when all I was was a simple fisherman. Back before he came into my life and everything was changed. Imagine what it must have been like for Jesus. Try to put yourself in our Lord's shoes. Have you ever faced that kind of rejection? Abandoned by someone you cared about deeply at the very moment when you needed them most. Watch them move on as if nothing had happened and you had never even been a part of their lives. Even if you haven't, you can probably imagine what it might feel like to look into the eyes of someone you loved only days after they had turned their back on you. And surely this is what our Lord felt when he came face to face with Peter. Which is what makes what happens next so remarkable. A lot of sermons about this encounter focus on the rhythms of speech or the vocabulary of this exchange, but what I want to note this morning is that what Jesus is doing here in chapter 21 is precisely what he has just commissioned his disciples to do just one chapter earlier. In his first post-resurrection words to his disciples, Jesus had bestowed upon them their resurrection calling to forgive sins. If you forgive the sins of any, Jesus said then, they are forgiven them. And so now, here with Peter, forgiveness is precisely what our Lord is doing too. And in so doing, Jesus starts to bridge the gap between the promise of Easter and our experience of life in this world. What do I mean by this? Well, in order to see this, we need to go back. Back to the beginning of creation. Back to the story in Genesis. When God first breathed new life into Adam's nostrils, just as Jesus breathed new life into his disciples in John 20, saying, receive the Holy Spirit and forgive. Shortly after Adam received the breath of God, Adam disobeyed God so that human lives came to be governed from that point forward by shame and blame, anger and fear. The woman turning against the man. The man turning against the serpent. And all of them turning their backs God. But now, the risen Christ comes to Peter and performs a completely new version of the human story. A story in which forgiveness replaces the old practices of bitterness and shame. Peace be with you, Jesus said in chapter 20. Come, eat. Be filled, Jesus says in chapter 21. 
Jesus comes to his disheartened disciple, tottering on the verge of a total relapse, and breathes into him a spirit that does not condemn, but works in and through him for peace and wholeness. Forgiving Peter, Jesus offers him a freedom from the fear that there is no bottom to our loss, that the hole in our lives can never be filled, and so frees us from all our vain attempts to fill the void, fill the emptiness by just going back to the way things were before Easter. And then, in a final turn, Jesus does something incredible. As the Father sent me, so I send you, Jesus said in chapter 20. And so he says to Peter, feed my sheep. What Jesus has done for Peter, what Jesus has done for the whole world, he now sends his disciples out into the world to do too. Now all of those who would follow Christ must be a people who forgive, who unlock the death grip that our sins have upon our souls, breaking their power forever. Now we have been empowered by Jesus to turn rejection into restoration, fear into faith, and betrayal into love. Simon, do you love me? Jesus said. The power to forgive sins is the mark of a new creation, a signal that the gap between the promise of Easter and our experience of life in this world is beginning, is starting to come undone. And as such, what Jesus does for Peter here is the foundation of the church's mission. This is how we, Jesus' disciples, practice Resurrection, the new life that began when Jesus was raised from the dead, the new life that came, and Jesus' victory over death. Practicing the forgiveness of sins is practicing resurrection. That is how we may come to believe that in the crucified and risen Lord, everything, everything, Everything has changed. This is no easy task. This work is often the work of years. Can I share with you a story in closing? I can think of no better contemporary example of the power of forgiveness than the late South African president, Nelson Mandela. As is well known, Mandela was in prison for 27 years in the belly of South African apartheid. The first 18 of these years he spent at the brutal Robben Island prison, a former leper colony, where he was confined to a small cell without a bed and without plumbing, compelled to do hard labor in a lime quarry. While at Robin, Mandela and his fellow prisoners were routinely subjected to all kinds of inhumane treatment, including, among other atrocities, (coughs) guards burying inmates up to their necks in the ground and urinating 
Mandela was only allowed to see his wife, the mother of his two daughters, once every six months. And he was never allowed to see his mother or his son, not even in the days before both died. Some years after he was freed, Mandela was asked this question. When you were leaving prison after 27 years, didn't you hate your captors? And to this question, Mandela said this, absolutely I did, because they had imprisoned me for so long. I was abused. I didn't get to see my children grow up. I lost my marriage in the best years of my life. I was angry. But as I got closer to the car that would take me away from there, I realized that when I went through that gate, if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I would still be in prison. They would still have me. I wanted to be free, Mandela said. And so I had to decide to let go. Even more than this, Mandela believed that the forgiveness that brought him freedom would bring freedom to his own country. It was mutual forgiveness, he said, that was the key to national reconciliation. And so Mandela led this effort personally, frequently inviting his former captors and oppressors including the man who tried to put him to death, invited them to have dinner with him. Sound like someone else we talked about this morning? <laughs> to have peace, Mandela said, one must learn to work even with your enemy, even to become your enemy's partner. And we all know the legacy of peace that Mandela's work left upon South Africa. For us, we are in the gap between the promise of resurrection and the day that promise will finally be fulfilled. We are in the midst of our own work of years. And so low spirited or not, we have each come here hoping to believe that Jesus was risen from the dead and that something, anything, everything has changed as a result. And so, All Saints Church, let me leave you with this. Do you want to see the dead raised? Do you want to see the kingdom of God on earth? Do you want to give the world something to believe in again? Then forgive. Forgive. Forgive even as you have been forgiven.
we stand and let us together proclaim our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, 